Well, in, in 1949, a scholar named Joseph Campbell wrote a now famous book called A Hero with a Thousand Faces. Uh, in the book, he argues that every story we tell is basically the same. Whether it's a novel, a movie, or a myth passed down through the ages, they all include the basic, same basic elements. They tell the, the same basic story. He calls it the hero's journey. And he explains that whether it's whatever type of story it is, it includes all the same basic elements. And one of those elements uh, is called the refusal of the call. Most of our heroes are reluctant ones. When fate comes calling, they turn away. Something is pulling at them to maintain the status quo of their lives. And sure enough, if you think about most stories, this is a very common element. I just showed you uh, an example of, of one heroic refusal with Eddie Murphy from the movie the Golden Child, way back in 87 or something. But there are others. When Princess Leia and Obi-Wan Kenobi first call Luke Skywalker for aid, he demurs, saying he has too much work to do on the farm. When the dwarves uh, first show up at Bilbo's place to recruit him as the burglar, he rejects their offer of adventure. When Poe is selected as the dragon warrior, who alone can defeat Tai Lung, he literally screams and runs away. When God calls Moses to deliver his people from slavery in Egypt, Moses actually asks God to send somebody else. I know my people are, are dying in Egypt, but you know me, I'm kind of shy. The heroes we like aren't supposed to jump right in. We don't like our heroes like that because that's not who we are. We are not like that. We are hobbits. We are shy, overstuffed pandas who have too much work to do on the farm. We like our heroes to be like us, reluctant, distracted, busy. We want our heroes to be people who inspire us to believe that despite our preference for the status quo, we can still achieve greatness. Well, if it is reluctant heroes that we prefer, have I got a story for you? It is a story about the ultimate reluctant hero. This hero fought at every opportunity along the way, but God stayed with him and drew him into a very high calling and in the process saved thousands and thousands and thousands of lives. And the story is a reminder, a lesson for us about how God can push through our own reluctance despite ourselves to do great and important things in our lives and in the world around us. I'm speaking, of course, about the story of Jonah. We're starting a new series here at Rooftop called Finding Nineveh, the story of Jonah. Maybe you know the story of Jonah. Maybe you don't know the story of Jonah. It's a story from the Old Testament. People love this story who know it uh, because it's so visual, it's so dramatic, it's so memorable, and it's so, at times, surprising. For many of us, it was one of the first stories we ever learned in church because it was so easy to demonstrate on the felt board, if you remember the story on the felt board. But I don't want to assume that everybody knows the story of Jonah. So let me go ahead and just sum up for you chapter one. We're going to spend four weeks on this and this four chapters of Jonah. One, two, three, four. So there once was a prophet named Jonah. And one day God sends a message to this prophet. We're not sure how God sends the message. Maybe it was through prayer. Maybe it was through a scroll from a beautiful Tibetan woman. Either way, the author writes that the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. Now, so you know, this is what prophets do. Prophets share news, usually bad news, from God to people who need to hear it. This is why prophets tended not to have a very life-long expectancy, because people didn't like usually hearing the bad news that God gave the prophets to give to them. Israel, in the Old Testament, they always had lots of pastors and lots of priests because the pastors and the priests were there to help them, but they usually only had like one prophet at a time because they killed all the rest. That's just about as much as they could put up, put up with. People didn't generally like the message that God had to give to them through prophets. And in this case, people really weren't going to like Jonah's news either. In this case, God calls Jonah to deliver a message to the people of Nineveh. Nineveh was a wicked place, and God had tagged them for destruction. God intended to destroy them unless they would repent of their sins, which we'll get to in a little bit. They were an evil, wicked place, and God at least wanted them to know and understand why he had tagged them for destruction. It was because of their own wickedness. 
And for the record, Nineveh was a very evil, wicked place. The city of Nineveh was one of the most powerful cities in the Middle East and was a true enemy of Israel. Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. And Assyria practiced genocide as a habit. They gobbled up other nations for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. In fact, at one point in Israel's history, there were, t- there were 12 tribes of Israel. There were 10 in the north and 2 in the south. You know this? Well, Assyria came in and basically eliminated the top 10 tribes through genocide and slavery. This was Nineveh. This was Assyria. And the remaining Israelites really didn't care for the Ninevites. The Israelites didn't care much for Nineveh. In fact, the prophet Amos in the Old Testament calls Nineveh the city of blood. He writes this, Woe to the city of blood, full of lies, full of plunder, never without victims, piles of dead bodies without number, people stumbling over their corpses. This was Nineveh, the place of death. Now, in a certain sense, Jonah should have rejoiced at God's announcement of destruction of this evil place. But for reasons that we're going to get to in a moment, Jonah does not jump at this opportunity. Joseph Campbell would say he refuses the call. He sends the dwarves away. In fact, not only does he refuse the call, but he packs his bags. The author writes that he jumps on a ship for Tarshish. Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He got on a boat the author writes, to flee from the Lord. Not only that, not only does he try to get away from the Lord here, he tries to flee as far away as he possibly can. Tarshish is an ancient city that would now be located in modern-day Spain. If you see it on a map, it's about as far away as anybody back then can ever imagine getting from where they were. It's at the edge of the known universe. Spain was the edge of the known universe back then. It's like us thinking, hey, let's go to Pluto. That's how far away I want to get from what God has told me to go. Jonah thought that if he get really, 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 really far away from Israel, he could escape God. Maybe if I get across the county line, maybe I can escape God's jurisdiction. Maybe if I can get the Duke boys to drive me across the county line, get past the billboard, Sheriff Roscoe P. God can't get me. But Jonah had forgotten his basic theology here. He is not worshiping some local, regional deity. He is worshiping the one true God of the universe. The God of Jerusalem is the God of Nineveh, is the God of Tarshish. And the darndest thing happens when Jonah is on that boat. God finds him. God finds out where he is. The author writes, the Lord sent a great wind on the sea and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. Now the sailors on the boat, they're not like Hebrews or anything. And they pray to their own individual gods that the storm would let up, but it doesn't. They figure out somebody on board has done something to upset their own individual god. So they cast lots to find out who. They basically draw straws. Jonah draws the short straw And he fesses up, he admits, I am a Hebrew, I worship the Lord, the God of everything. Now the sailors are actually terrified of this. They had never before met anybody who worshipped the one true God of everything. They worship their own local deities, their own small little G-gods. They never met somebody who like worships the one true God of everything. And then we find out that that this guy on their ship, Jonah, worships the one true God of everything. They're they're really nervous. Because apparently this, this, this guy has really upset the one true God of everything. And he is on their boat. And so they ask him, with some anxiety, what did you do against this one true God of everything? And he says, well, you know, God gave me something to do, and I didn't want to do it, so now I'm running from God. And he explains, the only way out of this is to throw me overboard. Throw me into the ocean, and then your problems will go away. Pick me up, throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know it was my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Understandably, the sailors don't want to do that. They don't want to murder the prophet of the one true God of over everything. So they try everything else to try to work this situation out. They try rowing back to shore. It doesn't work. They try throwing luggage overboard. That doesn't work. So finally, reluctantly, they hoist the prophet up on the plank and make him jump to his death in the churning sea. The author writes that immediately the raging sea grew calm. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. 
The story obviously continues. Jonah does not die bobbing in the ocean with this new boat full of converts steaming away from Tarshish. He makes it back in a very interesting way. But for our purposes, we already have plenty to talk about here in Jonah chapter 1. Jonah chapter 1 has a very simple and important point that many of you are already well aware of. You learned it when you were three years old on the felt board. What's the point of chapter 1? The point of chapter 1 is that we all run from important things God has given us to do. We all run from important things God has given us to do. The author practically says that that's what's going on in this story. Jonah's problem was that he was running from the Lord, or at least trying to. And we do that too. We all run from important things that God has given us to do. When I say we run from important things that God has given us to do, I'm not saying that we avoid important things that God has given us to do. I'm not saying that we uh, ignore important things that God has given us to do. I'm not saying that we forget to do or skip over important things that God has given us to do. I'm saying we run from them. We run from them at top speed to get away, as far away as we can from what God has given us to do. We are like gazelles running away from the Lord, our cheetah, trying to get us. We are like Usain Bolt bolting away as fast as we can from the field. We are like Harrison Ford in The Fugitive, trying to get as far away as we can from Tommy Lee Jones. We don't just avoid what God has given us to do. We run, hightail it away from God, what God has given us to do. As people, we have this knack of working really hard to avoid the will of God, even if it's good for us. Psychologist Abraham Maslow calls this the Jonah complex. And the Jonah complex is the fear of one's own greatness, the evasion of one's destiny. As Maslow writes, so often we run away from the responsibilities dictated by nature, by fate, I would add, by God, even sometimes by accident. Just as Jonah tried in vain to run away from his fate. We all suffer at times from the Jonah complex. We all try to avoid our fate. We all try running from Nineveh. What Nineveh am I talking about? Well, let Nineveh mean any hard but important thing that God has given us to do. Let that mean what Nineveh is. Any hard, important thing that God has given us to do. And God has given us many and many hard and important things to do. Our Ninevehs might be professional Ninevehs. They might be professional opportunities that God wants us to pursue educational ventures, professional uh, uh, career opportunities so that we can better serve the world, that we just don't do. Our Ninevehs might be relational Ninevehs. God might be calling us to reach out more deeply into the lives of loved ones or to raise our children more deliberately or to recommit ourselves to our failing, lackluster marriage. Our Ninevehs might be evangelistic Ninevehs. God might be, nope, God is calling us to reach out with the love of Christ to neighbors we don't know or co-workers we can't stand. Our Ninevehs might be spiritual Ninevehs. God might be calling us to address a personal sin in our lives that we just can't get away from. God might be calling us to seek some therapy or counseling or help from people at church to address a a long-lasting personal dysfunction that we can't get rid of. God might be calling us to commit ourselves to spiritual disciplines of prayer and fasting and scripture so that we can get to know him better. We all have none of us. The calling of God is on every single one of our lives. God has given every single one of us a call. Every time we hear a sermon, we hear the call of God. Every time we read the Bible, we hear the call of God. Every time we see a problem in the world that we know we can do something about and we can't stop thinking about it, we hear the call of God. God is always coming to us as he did to Jonah, telling us to go to Nineveh, but instead of embracing that call and pursuing it, we run. We flee. Why? Because we are reluctant heroes. Because we're human beings, and this is what human beings do. Human beings run. Our hearts are not naturally inclined toward the will of God. Our hearts and our wills are more inclined towards other things. Other things 
keeping us from embracing and pursuing the will of God. What things? Well, I can at least think of a few things that make us run from God. First, fear. Fear makes us run. Fear made Jonah run. One of the words used repeatedly in the story of Jonah is the word great, great. The Lord sends a great fish. The Lord sends a great wind to tear up the boats. Nineveh itself is a great city, the author writes. And Nineveh was, in fact, a a, a great city. It was unrivaled in its greatness. The author writes that Nineveh was so great, Nineveh was so big of a town that it took a man three days to walk from one end to the other. That's a great big city. Now, Jonah might have been a a, a prophet, and he had to have some courage like that, but he was still at heart a, a, a country boy from Israel. And an assignment like this, a great big assignment like this, is going to intimidate even the most seasoned prophet. I mean, he had to travel across the country, he had to learn a new language, and then he had to go preach a sermon of destruction to a whole bunch of people who already hated him and wanted to destroy him. I mean, that sort of assignment, great big assignment, is going to intimidate the most courageous hero, even though it might have come for the one true God of everything, is still going to intimidate the pants off of him, and it did. This was a great big assignment that God had given Jonah, and some of the things God has given us to do are also great big assignments. When God calls us to confess our sins to one another, that's a great big assignment. When God calls us to start a church or a new ministry, it's a great big assignment. What I find personally, though, in my life, though, it's not the great big assignments that intimidate me as much as it is the tiny little small opportunities I face every day that scare me just as much. It's not the great big things that scare me. It's the little things. I remember when I was in high school, I was up, in, up at Parkway North one Saturday and getting ready to take the ACT, and a whole bunch of my friends were up there. We were all hanging out before the ACT, and I remember looking over the hallway, and I saw this guy standing by himself. His name was John Hasselbauer. And I knew him because I had gone to grade school with him. I was a Cub Scout with him. But it was like 10 years ago. I hadn't seen him since. But he had moved out of the area, he went to a different high school, and he had to come up to school to take the ACT. And I saw him standing by himself, and he looked kind of lonely. And I remember thinking, I should go say hi to him. That's John Hasselbauer. I haven't seen him forever. I knew what I should do. And all of a sudden, I got afraid. I thought, uh, maybe that's John Hasselbauer. Maybe he won't remember me. This could get awkward. So I didn't do anything. I went and took the ACT. I think about that all the time. Because I knew what I should do, and I got scared, and I didn't do it. It's the little things every day that God gives me to do that I don't do. It's not the big things. I mean, those are too obvious to ignore. (laughs) It's it's the little things that just find a way not to do. I am generally very courageous on big things, but it's the little things. I am like Tweedledum in Lewis Carroll's Through the Looking Glass, who said, I am very brave generally, only today I happen to have a headache. We are normally very brave, except when God gives us something to do. Then we happen to have a headache. Fear of great big tasks makes us run. Also, comfort makes us run. The comfort of what we know makes us avoid what God has given us to do. On this point, let me tell you a little bit about the town called Tarshish, the city Jonah was heading towards. According to scholars, while Nineveh was a great big military town, a capital fit for the Assyrian hegemony. Tarshish was not. Tarshish was a town of trade and commerce. Tarshish uh, was a wealthy town with all the comforts a seaside commercial center could provide, and Jonah was going to Tarshish. I mean, if you're going to avoid the call of God, you might as well be comfortable avoiding it. But we all do this. God's calling on our lives almost always involves sacrifice and discomfort. Rarely will following God be good for our wallet. Seldom does following God make our lives easier. And we choose choose comfort all the time, like the rich young ruler in the Gospel of Matthew. You know the story of the rich young ruler in the Gospel of Matthew. God comes up to Jesus and says, "What what must I do to have eternal life? Jesus puts it to him straight. What does he say? Sell everything you have, give it to the poor. And come follow me. What does a man do? <laughs> he runs. Matthew says, when the man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. 
even though what Jesus promises us in the long run is greater, more fulfilling, more joyful, more of everything, we're comfortable now. So we run. Fear makes us run. Comfort makes us run. Also, protest makes us run. Protest. What I, what I mean here is that we just sometimes don't like what God has given us to do. At the root of it, I think this is what upsets Jonah the most. The reason he ran from God and Nineveh is because he didn't want anything to do with those wicked Ninevites. To preach against the Ninevites implies caring about the Ninevites. I preach to you, sometimes even preach against you, because if you can believe this, I care for you. Somebody laughed. (laughs) He couldn't believe it. (laughs) To preach against the Ninevites implies sort of caring for their souls. I mean, God said it's it's wickedness, and if his wickedness has come up against me, and Joni can't even figure out what God's doing paying attention to the people in Nineveh. I mean, I'm not going to be part of this missionary effort to the city of Nineveh, Jonah tells the Lord. We do this too. We run in protest too. We don't like what God's given us to do, so we just don't do it. I mean, so many of the things that God has given us to do just seem unfair to us. When God tells us to love and serve our enemies, to turn the other cheek when they slap us, to give, us, to give them our cloak uh, when they ask for it, to go the extra mile if they ask to go the extra mile, that, that, that is by definition all very unfair things that God has given us to do, and we don't want to do this, so we don't do them. When God tells us to bake a cake at a gay wedding, because loving enemies like that is the sort of thing Christians should be doing, even if we disagree with what's happening. We'll refuse to do it on legal grounds and argue that our rights are being violated, not going to do it. When God tells us to stay married to someone who's hard to love, as though there's any other type of person that's to be married to, when God tells us to be married, to stay married to somebody who's hard to love, we're like, but God, you, don't even, you can't even imagine how painful this is. I'm not going to do it. When God tells us to tithe at least 10% of our money to ministries and poor people and, and churches, we're like, God, but you don't, you don't know how little I make. <laughs> you don't know the stack of bills on my desk. I'm, I'm just not going to do it. It's not, that's not fair. When God tells us to forgive people who have hurt us even deeply, we'll remind God of just how wicked what they did to us is. And we'll refuse to do it. Even though what we've done against God is like 200 million times as bad as what they did against us, and God forgives us for that anyway. We all run in protest. No, I refuse to do that. Or fear. No, I, I can't do that. Or, or comfort. No, I, I, I won't do that. We're all runners. At every turn, we run from God, going to great lengths to get away from him. So here's your question for the morning. What's your Nineveh? What are you running from? What person has God called you to love? What scripture has God called you to obey? What has God given you to do? What's your Nineveh? And why are you running? Fear. Comfort. Protest. We're all running from God. That's the lesson of Jonah. But if there's another lesson of Jonah, chapter 1 here, it's just as important. The lesson is that we can't outrun God. We need to learn what Jonah did, that there is nowhere we can run that can get us away from the one true God who reigns reigns over everything. We cannot get away from God by going to Tarshish. He is the God of every country and every county. He is the Lord of every state and every suburb. He is the Almighty of every nation and every nook. He is everywhere we go. And not only is he everywhere we go, but he is always working with us to make a way for us to stop running. He is always providing a way out. And in Jonah's case, God came up with, shall we say, a rather creative way to bring his prophet back. You know what God did. He provided a fish. A great big fish. As the author writes, the Lord provided a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was inside the fish three days and three nights. Now, I have no idea how this worked. I am stumped by the logistics. How did Jonah breathe? How was Jonah not digested by great fish stomach acid? The author does not seem interested in explaining the mechanics here. The author's simple point here is that God provided the fish as a way to get Jonah back on track. This fish was a means of deliverance sent by the Lord to get Jonah back on course. This fish was the Lord's provision. 
God is always providing fishes to bring us back. God is always providing people to remind us what we need to be doing. God is always providing sermons to get us back on what we're thinking about. God is always providing conversations and opportunities to give us a chance to recommit. There's a preacher named Arthur Kemp who I read about this week who can testify to this. He talks about it in a book called God's Yes Was Louder Than My No. In the book, he tells how his family had predicted and prophesied that he was going to be a preacher when he grew up. Even as a young man, he knew what God had called him to do. He could hear God tell him, go feed my sheep, go preach to my people. He knew what he needed to do, but Kemp was afraid. He didn't see himself worthy of that call, so he told God no. And he spent the next phase of his life trying to screw himself up so bad that God wouldn't want him. He writes this, I was determined that I was going to be the worst possible human being you could be, to make myself unfit to be a minister. He didn't know how to gamble, but he learned how to gamble. He didn't know how to drink, but he learned how to drink. He became a pimp. He dealt drugs to get away from God. He was hellbound for Tarshish. But Kemp never got away. He wasn't happy with this life that he had built for himself. So on one desperate night, he went to a prayer meeting, and it all came out. He cried and he cried, and he told the pastor, I've got to preach, I've got to preach, I know I've got to preach. He jumped off the boat, and now he's a successful pastor in South Carolina. Even when we say no, and we say no all the time, God's saying yes. God is always saying yes. God is always providing a way for us to follow his calling, to obey his will, no matter how far we've gone. I mean, you might be so far God from God, so far away from God, you can't even imagine finding your way back. But there is always a way back. There's always a fish there waiting to carry you back. You might be strung out on drugs, sleeping with three different people, there's always a way back. There's always a great fish there waiting for you. You might, be, you might have gotten on the wrong career path years ago. You might have wanted to do X, but your parents told you you needed to do Y, and you're unhappy now, and you don't see any way to get back. There's always a way back. God can always provide a fish for you. You might have passed up opportunity after opportunity to love your neighbor or invite your ignorant co-workers to church. You, your neighbors and your co-workers might think you were the rudest Christian alive. But there is always a way back. There's always another opportunity to get back on track. You might have told God that there's no way you're staying married to your spouse. It's impossible God to even met this person. But there is always a way back, always a great fish. You might be so addicted to alcohol or porn that you think there's no use trying anymore. You might as well just live it up. You might as well jump off the boat to your death. But there is always a way back if you take it. Of course, the only real way back to God's will, the only real way back to our calling, is in Christ. It's in Jesus. He is our way back. He is the great fish that God has provided. In the New Testament, when Jesus talks about his death and his resurrection, he calls it the sign of Jonah. As Jesus says, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so I will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And then Jesus say he will emerge from the tomb as Jonah did from the fish. Jesus himself is calling himself the great fish of God. He is the way God has provided for us to return to him, to get off the boat, to Tarshish, otherwise known as hell, because the truth is that we are all sinners. We are sinners who have disobeyed God and have hurt one another. We deserve God's wrath. We deserve the punishment of hell, but God loves us too much to give up on us So he sent us a fish. He threw us a line. He sent to us Jesus who died on the cross and took the punishment for our crimes and he rose from the dead to make a way for us to live with him forever. Communion reminds us of this. Communion is something that followers of Christ have been doing for thousands of years as a reminder of who we are as God's people. We are God's family. We're gathered around the dinner table remembering our Savior who suffered on the cross so that we could live forever. The bread reminds us of his body, which was broken for him. The cup reminds us of his blood, which was poured out for him. Communion reminds us that Jesus is the great fish that God provided for us so that we could know the promise and the hope of eternal life. Communion reminds us that no matter how far we've run from God, God is still with us, making a way for us to come back for him. So I know you came in here this morning running from God. You came in here running from his calling. You came in here running from his commands. You came in here running from his love. The lesson of Jonah is just to stop 
running, stop running, jump into the fish that God has provided in Jesus Christ who alone can you bring you back to him. Here at Rooftop, we practice open communion, which means that anybody can participate who identifies themselves as a follower of Christ, anybody who believes in Jesus as the unique Son of God and has demonstrated that faith through baptism and repenting of sins can join us at the table in a moment. Uh, the greeters are going to be here with the bread and the cup when you're ready. Come on down, get a bit of bread, dip it in the cup. I'll come back up and pray afterwards.